Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the HPC and Big Data and Data Science Dev Room. Um, we're very happy to organize this Dev Room this year. So uh, I will briefly introduce the organizers. Uh, Kenneth here from uh, University of Ghent, uh, Roman from Tribune Lab and the Apache Software Foundation, and uh, well, Ewan is not here, <laughs> and myself, I'm from KTX in Stockholm. Uh, so today we're going to have a mix of talks uh, from Big Data, HPC, uh, Data Science. And, uh, so uh, we had uh, really many submissions. We have 48 submissions. <laughs> and we only accepted, well, we did our best to accept as many as we could. So we're going to have 20 talks, so 15, 20 minute talks and 5 lightning talks. Um, so we'll start right away. We have a lot of things to present. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Theodore from the faculty. And he's going to talk about machine learning. So, hello everybody, thanks for coming so early, even after the Saturday, I guess we have to do that. Uh, so, I'm a researcher at the Swedish Institute for uh, Computer Science, and uh, the past year I've been working on uh, LinkML, which is a uh, large scale machine learning language for the budget plane. Uh, so, to start, I would like to focus a bit on uh, what we mean by large scale machine learning and uh, why we need it, and uh, maybe to clarify it. Uh, so when people talk about large-scale machine learning or uh, big learning, uh, the very common thing that we hear is uh, talking about the data size. So we have big learning tasks when uh, our data is so big that it cannot fit into the memory of one machine, or our model is so big that it cannot fit into the memory of one machine. Uh, but they never say which machine. So for me, it's very important to clarify that the size of your computer is not an intrinsic property of the data. So that's not a good definition. Uh, if we want to be precise, we shouldn't be using our current computing capabilities in order to define our learning tasks, but rather we should be uh, talking about uh, specific learning tasks. And that way we can differentiate between uh, small-scale and uh, large-scale uh, learning. And we have uh, uh, small-scale learning when the uh, active budget constraint that we have is the number of examples. So in cases where the uh, data is limited and obtaining it uh, is uh, costly, we would have a small-scale uh, learning, uh, learning task. On the other hand, we would have a large-scale uh, learning task when our active budget constraint is actually the time. So you can imagine in any kind of uh, big data uh, scenario, we have uh, so much data that uh, we don't really need uh, anything else in order to do our learning. However, we are limited uh, from the time. As such an example, you can think of a company like uh, Spotify. Let's say that they want to provide recommendations for all the users every day. Now, if that computation takes one and a half days, that is useless. So they, what they have is that an actual uh, time constraint there. They need to be able to, to, to make the, the answers work within the, the time that they have, uh, despite of uh, the millions and billions of data points that they might have available. And this is the type of learning that concerns us uh, with Flink. So before diving into Flink and the large-scale machine learning uh, issues, I would like to um, uh, introduce Apache Flink very briefly, for those not familiar with the platform. And uh, for those that want to learn more, the, there's a talk coming up at uh, 4 p.m. here by Till Rollman that's going to delve into more details about the uh, engine. So Apache Flink is a distributed data processing uh, platform with a streaming data flow engine uh, at its core. It provides a powerful and easy to use, uh, easy to use APIs for uh, streaming and uh, batch processing. And it's a technically advanced engine that has a, a number of features that make it very good for large-scale machine learning tasks. So here we can see the Flink task. It works well within the Hadoop ecosystem. It uh, can uh, uh, use many data, and ma many data sources. It uh, provides high availability through Zookeeper. And on top of the uh, data and stream processing APIs, it provides a number of libraries, like uh, Jelly for uh, graph processing, the table API for SQL-like queries, and Flink ML, uh, which is the machine learning. So what makes Flink a, a good platform to use for uh, machine learning? So we'll take a look, uh, a brief look into some of these features that, uh, that uh, make it a, a good candidate. So first, it's the Flink API that provides uh, uh, a functional style programming, maybe with some SQL-like uh, commands, like uh, GroupI, for example. 
And this allows for the quick development of uh, and prototyping of machine learning algorithms. Uh, and the programmers get the familiar paradigm to, to, do, to, to write their programming, but it's also intuitive. And at the core of uh, Flink lies its uh, streaming uh, data flow uh, engine. And using this engine, we're able to set up a, a set of operators at the, the beginning of uh, deploying a job and then continuously pipe data uh, through without having ex explicit processing uh, stages. So this type of engine makes uh, real-time uh, uh, stream processing possible in Flink. And what it also does is that uh, it provides us with uh, nat native iterations. And native iterations allow, allow us to write certain problems, like most machine learning problems, without materializing the intermediate. So, and when compared in fact with the uh, batch engine, like for example Apache Spark, a new stage has to be submitted uh, at, at the end of each iteration, and that creates additional uh, scheduling overhead. Now what we are able to do with Flink instead is that we are able to maintain a partial solution that you can think, for example, the, your machine learning, uh, the model of your machine learning algorithm is a partial solution and we are able to iteratively update it within the same data. Now in addition to batch iteration, Flink also provides, uh, provides us with delta iterations. Now what delta iterations do is that they allow us to shrink the size of the problem as we near its solution. And this is something that is uh, very useful in cases like uh, graph processing, and uh, it could also be the same principle could be applied as well for machine learning problems. So, with that in mind, let's uh, take a look into uh, ClickML. So, the development of uh, ClickML started uh, last spring, and the first version was re released with uh, version 0 0.9 uh, of Link. And uh, I should mention that it's uh, written completely in Scala. So, the library was designed with uh, three goals in mind. The first one is uh, to be truly scalable. So we want uh, efficient algorithms and communication efficient algorithms that uh, allow us to actually scale scale the processing that we do with web scale or societal scale data. Uh, the second one is the minimization of blue code. Now when we talk about blue code, we, we mean all the code in a machine learning program that is not machine learning. It's, it's the thing that uh, ties all the things together in, in order to make it work. And, According to a recent publication from Google, a mature machine learning program might end up having 95% glue code and only 5% is actual logic. And what we try to do with FlinkML is actually try to minimize the amount of glue code that developers need to write. And the third one is uh, ease of use. We uh, focus on having uh, familiar and easy to, to use APIs. We want to provide good documentation and examples and support for the users. So they're able to jump right into writing stuff. <coughs> So we'll take a, uh, a look at the, some uh, of the algorithms that are currently available on uh, FlinkML. So starting with the, the supervised learning, we provide a generalized uh, uh, optimiza uh, convex optimization framework. It uh, currently has the uh, implementation of stochastic uh, gradient descent that you can use for any learning task. Uh, we pr provide the support vector machines and uh, multiple linear regression as well. And uh, we also have a highly scalable uh, ALS uh, implementation that uh, scales to data sizes uh, that uh, companies uh, of the size of uh, Spotify might have. And the growing set of uh, common pre-processing uh, algorithms for machine learning tasks. And the one feature that we took care to include from the beginning was the support for machine learning pipelines. And these allow us to uh, develop complex sequences of machine learning tasks with minimal blue uh, So with that, we can take a brief look at the API. And so we can see how easy it is to write a small machine learning program with Flink ML. So if using the standard uh, Flink data processing commands, we can just read uh, a, a training and a test set. And then we can quickly uh, create a set properties for our learner. And uh, you can see that uh, we have some familiarity at least with uh, the scikit-learn uh, programming uh, uh, library, uh, the machine learning library, that, uh, which we do in order to, to provide our users with more familiarity. We can call fit to, to train the model, and once we have done that, we can just uh, start using our model uh, to, in order to make predictions. So we can see that in less than 10 lines of code, you can actually have a fully working, simple learning system that will scale, scale with your data. And I would also like to demonstrate how easy to, it is to create a machine learning pipeline. So what we will do here is uh, train a regression model after passing our data through a standard uh, scaling uh, algorithm, and then augmenting our features also with a 30 degree polynomial. So our pipeline is simply created by chaining together uh, as many operations uh, that we need. We start with our, uh, with our scaling, we chain the, the uh, polynomial features uh, transformer, and then finally we chain our predictor. And once we have the, that pipeline, we can treat it as any other learning. So we can just call fit on the, on the, on the pipeline itself, and it will 
actually pre-process all the data with the, all the transformers that we have used uh, previously and do the training. And the same applies for prediction. When we pass, uh, uh, when we pass a testing data set to the pipeline, it will actually transform and uh, perform all the transformations that we have ordered in, in our pipeline in order and then uh, actually uh, use the prediction. So next I would like to look at uh, some of the cutting edge uh, machine learning algorithms that we have implemented uh, in Flink in order to make it a, a truly scalable on their platform. So, First, I would like to talk about a relatively new uh, communication efficient optimization uh, algorithm. So, stochastic gradient descent, or SED, is perhaps the most widely used uh, uh, first order optimization uh, algorithm that is out there, and it's very popular in uh, uh, areas like uh, deep learning that have uh, seen a major resurgence now. And SED uh, strength comes from the fact that it's actually very simple to, to implement. And most distributed implementations use a, a very simple synchronization uh, scheme as well. At the end of each, uh, of each iteration, we uh, seek all the workers and then we move on to the next, uh, to the next one. That has a high communication code and it also includes slow updates to the model only at the end of iteration. So we can do better than that. So COCO, or uh, communication is important in that sense, is an algorithm by Yagi and, and others at uh, Berkeley. And this aims to reduce the communication costs in an optimization problem and uh, achieve faster convergence. And it uses a number of tricks that in order to achieve that, and we will see a couple of them. So first one, it moves from the primal optimization problem to the dual one. So the framework of uh, dual, dual optimization is conceptually simple. So what we do is that we transform our original primal uh, minimization problem into a dual, which is a, uh, which is a maximization problem. So once we do that, what we have actually is that the dual provides a, a bound for the primal problem. And uh, by having this bound, it's very easy then to have a stopping criterion when to stop iterating. So here's an example with the regularized uh, re uh, uh, regression problem. We take the primal minimization problem, we transform it into a maximization problem uh, uh, using a property that is uh, called the Lagrange duality. And for such problems, coordinate descent me uh, methods have been used uh, for uh, large-scale uh, problems. And they give stronger convergence, uh, convergence guarantees at the same iteration cost as uh, SDD. They also require uh, no step size, which is a, a major parameter that we need to set for stochastic gradient descent. And it gives us, uh, due to the duality that we have the bound, it gives us a very well-defined uh, stopping criterion for our iterations. And Another thing that we do at the stochastic gradient descent is that we update our model finally either at the end of each iteration or at the end of uh, our run, actually. So what, uh, by syncing all the workers. So that means that the, the, a lot of the workers might end up uh, working with a stale version of the model for a very long time. So in COCO, the updates are happening locally uh, within the workers without any communication, meaning that the, the workers have a, a very fresh model that they're iterating on. They only sync uh, as, uh, as little as possible at the end of uh, its uh, super step, let's say. And that uh, also reduces the communication cost. So this is basically uh, an illustration of how Coco works. Each work is a small, say, uh, <coughs> it's a small dual optimization problem. And uh, at the end of its uh, local iterations, it communicates only the, the update vector that it needs to, to, to the other uh, workers. And uh, we, we start the, the, the next super step. And this reduced uh, uh, communication as part of optimization can have great effects for the convergence uh, rate for, of the algorithm. So COCO here is the red line, and uh, the log, uh, we have a uh, log scale here. So if this uh, stochastic gradient descent and coordinate descent by uh, sometimes orders of magnitude in terms of performance. And this is what we use in order to perform optimization for uh, support vector machines uh, in Flink. So definitely COCO has a good performance, but it has one important disadvantage, and that is the barrier synchronization that uh, we mentioned. If, we, if you have a struggler in, the, in your cluster, which is a machine that is working uh, much lower than the rest, that means that all the faster workers need to wait for that struggling before moving on to the next iteration. So there is a way to deal with that as well. And that is uh, recent, uh, recent from uh, last year that is coming out uh, from uh, CMU by Professor uh, Eric Zing. And uh, it deals efficiently with struggles and achieves actually great performance. So we can take a look at the, the different synchronization schemes uh, that are available to us. So the first one is a block synchronous parallel. In, in this model, as we mentioned, at the end of each iteration, we wait for everybody to finish and then we move on to the next one. And of course, they can, this can have an adverse effect on uh, the speed of the, the convergence of the algorithm. 
Another option is to do something asynchronously and we let every worker work on its own and we don't release really sync and we just uh, uh, obtain the, the solution uh, by combining them all at the, at the end. So this is uh, possibly fast but it can, it can also lead to diverging solutions because uh, many workers can have uh, uh, very different versions uh, of the model and uh, uh, that, that can, uh, that can uh, result that we just uh, diverge and we don't uh, arrive at any solution ever. So as a compromise between the two is uh, to have stale synchronous iteration. So what, uh, with stale synchronous iterations, what we, what we do is that the fastest workers can only be up to k iterations ahead of the slowest one. And if they are about to, uh, to move further ahead, we stop them and we tell them to wait until the, the slowest one gets caught up. So this allows the faster workers to, to work and update the model so we achieve faster convergence, but ensures that the slow workers will also will not fall, uh, fall too far behind in order to, to make sure that uh, the algorithm uh, will converge. So look, taking a look uh, graphically, so here worker one is the fastest one, and if it manages to reach iteration seven, since we have a, a stainless threshold of three, it will actually have to stop there and wait for worker two to catch up before moving on to the next iteration. So here we can uh, take a look at the performance of uh, stainless synchronous uh, in Flink. So the blue line is actually bulk synchronous, and uh, what uh, has happened here is in, in the cluster, at, uh, any, at any point in time, uh, one of the nodes is, uh, has generated load of 100% uh, for 12 seconds. So that means that we basically have a struggle in the system that uh, we create. And we can see that uh, by using the stale synchronous parallel the iterations, we're able to converge much faster than using the bulk, bulk uh, synchronous parallel, and they also achieve actually better uh, optimization uh, in the end. And this will soon be merged into uh, Flink and uh, Flink ML, and uh, uh, when that happens, it will be, to my knowledge, at least the first uh, de general purpose data processing platform that supports uh, state synchronous iterations. And so finally, I would like to talk about some more work that is currently being done in uh, Flink ML and what we have planned uh, for the future. So currently, we have all the tooling in place for the performance evaluation uh, of the model as, the, as well as the cross validation. And we're making it. Uh, we're working on making it easier to uh, uh, persist your models and export them in a PML language, for example. And all of these things are pending pull requests that we, we hope to be able to work very soon. And for our long-term plans, uh, we include two main areas. The first one is uh, streaming and efficiency. So for streaming, uh, Flink already has Samoa bindings, and uh, Samoa is uh, perhaps the most popular uh, online analysis platform out there currently. And our plan is to actually kickstart a uh, streaming machine learning uh, 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 library that will, that will include a, a number of uh, machine learning uh, algorithms in, in there. And the uh, other area of focus for us would be computation efficient algorithms. So the question is, how can we scale learning uh, uh, into societal scale data sets but using only modest <coughs> computing resources? Because not everybody is Google, not everybody has data sets with uh, 10,000 machines. So this is a major challenge for us. And we plan to use a lot of knowledge that is coming from the HPC field in terms of efficient computation, using GPUs and the like, in order to make sure that uh, we're actually using uh, all our hardware to its maximum potential. And this is it for me. Please check it out. You can go to flink.apache.org uh, to find more about Flink. And this is uh, the link for our uh, documentation. Thank you. Thank you. 